All right. So in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, the part of the passage I'm going to be focusing in on is that last part, those last few verses there that talk about, you know, running the race and running for the prize. And it says in verse number 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So now he's, what he's talking about is just an actual literal race. Right? He's going to make a spiritual application to something that we're all well aware of. There's a race, and you get a bunch of people together, they have a race, you go see the Olympics or whatever, there's a race, and people are racing, but there's only one winner. Right? There's only one person that's going to actually take home the gold, that's going to win the prize, that actually wins the race. And then he says, here, so run that ye may obtain. So we want to run the race that we have set before us that we can win. We're not just, you know, running to get the participation trophy. We're running to win the race. We want to win the prize. So we want to run. We need to live like we mean it. And we're going to start doing things and preparing ourselves to run that race and to be ready to go. That's why he says in verse 25, and every man that striveth for the mastery, to master what they're doing, to master that race, to, to be the one that succeeds, to be the one that wins. Everyone that strives for the mastery, it says, is temperate in all things. That word temperate means they're in control. They're moderating what they do, what they take in, their routine, their schedule. And what I'm preaching about this morning is temperance and being able to control yourself. There's a very, very important attribute to have in your life of being able to maintain temperance. You know, you heard the word people like losing their temper. It's the same word that comes from temperance. Being able to be temperate is controlling your temper. That's one aspect of being temperate is being able to control your emotions. You also need to be able to control your actions, what you do, being very disciplined about what you do. People who want to win a race physically in this world, you want to win a swimming race, a running race, you know, whatever. Those athletes need to be very disciplined. Do they not? They need to control what they eat. They control how much they sleep. They control what they're doing with their body because they're trying to get their body at, to the utmost performance to be able to do the job. They're controlling what's you know, even in their mind. The best athletes are not going to be taking mind-altering drugs and, and other things that are going to potentially negatively impact their performance. And in order to do that, you have to be very disciplined. And anyone who's ever been involved in any type of sports at all will know that. It can be very difficult to do some, you know, whether it's training, you know, any type of training, working out, physical activity, where week after week you're pushing yourself to do more. You're trying to, to build your endurance or build your strength. It requires a lot of discipline and temperance of being in control of what you're doing. Everything that we do in our life ought to be purposed and purposeful. And we're not just being very flippant in what we do, but we should have a goal. We should have a purpose. We're reaching forward for that prize. We're living our life in a way that's going to be honoring and glorifying to God and in a way where we're going to be walking in the Spirit, in a way we're going to be reaching the most people and running this race and doing the most to succeed and to win that prize at the end of our life. Get the best reward when we're done working for the Lord in this life. In order to do that, we need to be temperate, and we need to be temperate in all things, being able to control ourselves. Obviously, if you can fully master temperance, then you can be without sin. Now, we know no one's ever going to be fully capable of doing these things, but that's the goal. That's what we're striving for, right? We want to be able to keep our body in subjection to the point of if my flesh is telling me it wants to do this and it wants to do that, and I have this lust and I have this desire and it's something that's sinful, we can mentally say, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm in charge here. I'm the one in control. I'm not going to let my body dictate what we're going to do what I'm going to do and just lead me off into whatever just feels good because it's going to potentially detract from the prize, detract from running and winning the race. Athletes do it all the time. 
I mean, think about someone who's trying to get their body physically fit. I mentioned this before. They're not going to be off. The, the winners are not going to be off getting drunk, doing drugs, and, doing, and, and consuming all of these things that are just going to make them feel good temporarily. Why? Because they've got the vision. They've got the goal in mind. I want to win this prize. And that's important to me, so I am going to control my body. I'm going to control what I do. Similarly, we need to have that same level of control. Look at verse number 26. He says, I therefore, it says in verse 25, I didn't read the, the latter half. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. They do it to win that trophy. They do it to win that gold, that, you know, that medal, whatever, whatever their prize is. It's corruptible. It's going to be gone. It's, it's ultimately going to be vanity, Right? I mean, those sports team, they win the Super Bowl, they get that trophy, they get their ring. It's a corruptible prize. Here today, gone tomorrow. It's going to last in people's minds for a short period of time and then it's gone. But we an incorruptible. A prize that never ends. Eternal rewards. Eternal prizes. Now that's something to strive for. That's something that ought to be very important to us. Say, hey, I could dedicate my life and spend my time being temperate to achieve this trophy or this money or this house or this car, whatever it is. It's just going to be gone. I mean, yeah, you can enjoy it for a short period of time, but why would you want to waste so much of your effort and your time focusing on things like that when you could actually achieve, you could actually secure for yourself rewards and prizes that don't go away, that will last you an eternity. I mean, just let that sink in. What God is going to give you will last an eternity. You can actually hold on to that. You can actually take something with you when you go. And it's going to be those spiritual rewards. It's not going to be anything in this life. It's not going to be anything physical. But the rewards that God will give you, you can accumulate that right now. Start building up your spiritual 401k by putting in the good work. By making yourself a better worker, producing even more and more and more by keeping yourself and your body in subjection and being temperate in all things. That's how you're going to get it done. That's how you're going to win that prize. Look at verse number 26. I therefore so run. Not as uncertainly. See, we can have certainty also to our, to our race, to our fight. They don't know. There's way much more uncertainty. He says, so fight I. Not as one that beat at the air. Like you're just fighting against nothing. I have certainty is what he's saying. I, I do know what the goal is. I know what I'm fighting. I know what the race is. And I know how to win it. And I can do it. Verse number 27 is, but I keep under my body and bring it un into subjection. So he's saying is, I am in charge of my body. I'm bringing my body. My body's going to be subject to me. So my body's not going to dictate what I'm going to do. I will. It says, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So in order to be the most effective preacher, because look, that's the race, isn't it? The race that he's running, he's talking about preaching to others. He's talking about reaching the lost. He's talking about reaching other people and helping people through the preaching of God's word. That's the race. That's what he's striving for. And if he becomes some big hypocrite and he's trying to teach other people to do something and, and he's not doing it himself and he's not keeping his own body in subjection and he's not living what he's preaching, he's basically saying that it's going to be worthless. He's not going to be very effective at what he's doing, and that's not the way he's going to win. You're going to win that race. Now, I, I like bringing this up just because we're at this verse and at this passage, and anytime I could give a little bit of a plug as to why we're King James only, that's not the focus of the, of the sermon tonight, but why we believe a King James Bible only, this particular verse. Verse number 27 in, of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you read this in the NIV, I'll read it for you. This makes perfect sense. Did anyone have a hard time understanding I keep under my body and bring it into subjection? That's just teaching. I'm in control. I'm in charge. My body's subject to me. Right? Well, the way that this is translated in NIV, starting in verse 26, says, Therefore I do not run like someone running aimlessly. 
I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave. So I strike a blow to my, like, like, I mean, the way that reads is you're literally going to, going to, I mean, it wasn't me to strike a blow. No! <laughs> And it's kind of funny, it's kind of silly, but you know there are people in the world that believe that they're extra spiritual when they put themselves through pain and torture. There's Catholics in, I think it's either in the Philippines or some of one of the Asian countries that they go through these, these rituals every year to kind of reproduce like the pain and suffering that Jesus went through. And they'll like go through, the, they'll whip themselves and flog themselves and do these things and think that they're being, you know, extra spiritual by doing these things. And when you read a translation like this, they could toy this and be like, no, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave. See, it's in the Bible. Whereas we say, no, God doesn't want you destroying your body, the temple of the Holy Ghost, and just, you know, doing these things for no reason. If you end up suffering persecution at the hands of someone else, that's different than you just taking it on yourself to strike a blow to your own body. Because that's not what this verse says, and it's not what it teaches at all. It's just talking about being in control and not allowing your body to come to harm or get yourself into sin. So, anyways, I, I just threw that in there because... The first time I heard that, <laughs> I kind of, I laughed like pretty much everybody here did because it is kind of funny. But there are people who actually believe this, that that is God's word. And it couldn't be farther from the truth. And we need to just be able to expose this type of stuff so that people who are deceived into thinking that, hey, I'm reading God's word to show them stuff like this. Like, this is ridiculous. This is not what God's saying at all. How could you pick up that book and read that garbage and say, yep, these are God's words? It's not true. It's false. Anyways, let's continue on here. Turn if you would to Romans chapter 13. We need to be able to control our flesh. We need to be temperate, in charge, in control. There's multiple ways to be in control. first thing we ought to be able to do is control our environment. Don't make provision for your flesh to even cause that temptation in the first place. Look at Romans 13, verse number 13. The Bible says, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. You should already know the areas of your life that you might struggle with. Or even if you don't struggle with them, you know what, what sin is. You know what the Bible says about many, many different things. So I'm going to start giving you some examples of how you might be able to make provision for your flesh. And I'll start with a very easy one. Getting drunk. Getting drunk is a sin in the Bible. Very clear, very evident. It's something that no Christian should ever do. Not just getting drunk, but even just drinking alcohol, I believe, is a sin. I'm not going to get into all that today, but here's my point. You say, well, I want to make sure I don't drink alcohol as a Christian. Well, then you need to control your environment and make sure you're not going to be allowing for the opportunity to even arise to have that temptation. So that way, if you're in a weak point, if you're having a hard time with your flesh, you're going to be way less likely to, to get drunk, to allow yourself to even do that by controlling your environment. So how can you control your environment? One, make sure you don't have any booze or any liquor in the house, right at home. That's a very good first step. If it's not even there to consume, how are you going to get drunk? But there's many other ways. Number two, you got friends, you got buddies, and they're, going, they're all going to go out to a bar somewhere. You can say, yeah, but I don't drink. Yeah, but you're putting yourself in a situation if you're going to be surrounded by a bunch of people 
Oh, hey, let's do a shot. Let's get around or whatever. Hey, you never have a drink. Why don't you have a drink? You're putting yourself in a situation for someone to maybe convince you to get involved with what they're doing. Don't put yourself in that situation. Don't go out to the bar. Don't put yourself in these environments where it's going to be very, a lot easier for you to slip and fall and make that provision for the flesh. That's just one example. How about, you know, committing fornication or adultery? You might not even have it in your heart to look on other women or other men. And praise God, I hope you don't. But we need to be able to control our environment to make sure that something like that is never going to happen. That's why I personally have rules in place that you won't see me traveling in a vehicle like alone with someone of the opposite gender unless it's like my mother, <laughs> right? Or someone that's family like that where obviously there's no reason to be concerned. But even though... I have no intention. I have no reason to think on other women. I love my wife. I don't ever, you know, I'm not thinking about doing anything. But I'm going to make sure that there's not going to be times for me to start get it, building relationships even and being close to someone of, an opposite, of the opposite gender to, to even have that become a thought to begin with. Because I don't want to make, because the flesh is wicked. And the flesh is going to drive you to sin. And we need to be aware of that and understand that nobody is above sin. Nobody has arrived to the point of where I'm just so hyper-spiritual, there's no way I could ever do anything like that. The Bible gives us plenty of examples of great men of God that have done great things, have been used mightily, and lived probably great lives, but still fell, still succumbed to sin. And we need to take heed lest we fall. And the way we take heed is by making sure that we're not going to make provision for our flesh. Don't put yourself in those environments. Don't go to the websites that are going to have the, 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 the bad images put in front of your eyes. Don't watch the TV that's going to be putting the wicked imagery in front of your eyes. Don't, don't allow that. Don't even put yourself in a situation. Take control and make sure you do not make provision for your flesh. Maintain the discipline and the temperance that you need to be able to run the race and not have to worry about these, these, the sin, the weight of sin that doth so easily beset us to, to, to cause you to stumble and fall. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs uh, Proverbs 23. So we need to be in control, control our flesh, control the environment as much as you can. Obviously, there's some things you have no control over just in the world in general, but you do control where you go. You control, you control what you eat. That's going to be our next thing. You know, what, what you even put in your mouth, if you're going to be healthy, if you're going to, you know, try to even just... Just your physical health is important. It's important. Your spiritual health is more important, but I'll tell you what, how are you going to go out and really maximize how many people you can reach and what you can do for the Lord if you just fill up on whatever food and junk food you can and just become a fat slob and you're just going to be worn out and not able to do things physically because you're indulging and overindulging in whatever, and you have no control over what you're putting into your body. Proverbs 23, look at verse number one. We need to be temperate in our appetite. The Bible says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat. If thou be a man given to appetite, be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Now, obviously, there's a little bit more going on here than just you know, your, your physical appetite for things. We were talking about being, you know, sitting down with a ruler, someone who might have an ulterior motive against you, who's going to try to entice you with something that you really like. He's saying if that is, if he's going to try to, to, to bribe you or to sway you or to get you to do something that you wouldn't normally do because it goes against your ethics, it goes against your morals, your values in the Bible. He says, put a knife to your throat. Don't make, make sure you're not going to make that provision for the flesh and understand, hey, that's deceitful meat. 
don't let him flash the money and the cars and the, 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 the sin in front of your nose, in front of your eyes to entice you to, to join up with him to do something wicked. Whoever that is, a ruler, a boss, acquaintance, family, whoever. It's talking about keeping control, maintaining that temperance. Flip over to Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. This does have a little bit more to do with the actual food that you're consuming. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, right after the book of Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse number 17. Ecclesiastes 10, 17. The Bible says, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. What it's talking about is, is, you know, the reason why we eat food is because we need to, to survive, right? Our bodies need the fuel to keep going, to get strength. We eat breakfast. Why? So we could be strengthened throughout the day. We eat lunch to, to maintain our strength, to keep working, right? We eat dinner to be able to, to finish off the day and, and maintain the strength that our body needs. But the moment that that eating goes from just being for strength and being there to, to, to help you get things done to just being for drunkenness, where you're just going into excess and you're just indulging in everything just, just because you can. And this, was, you know, this is talking about people who have that ability to do so and do so on a regular basis while they're princes. You know, then you're not going to be blessed. He says you're blessed when this is what the reason is. You're doing it for utility. You're doing it. To, to maintain your strength, but not for drunkenness. And we need to be able to control that in our diet. That can apply to us as well. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 18. So we need to be able to control our environment. That's one way of controlling your flesh, is just making sure you're not making provision for your flesh. You need to control what you're literally putting in to your belly, into your body. But not only that, of course, we also need to control... The, the way that the flesh would desire anything other anything else that might be sinful, right? Food isn't sinful, but when you start overindulging in things and you start um, ingesting is not healthy, it's going to make you not as productive for the Lord or maybe shorten your lifespan or whatever. You're not going to get as much done. Then you've got a problem. But other things you can ingest, other things that your flesh wants, we need to have control and mastery over that as well. Now, we're going to look at a couple of examples of Jesus Christ because he is the perfect example of a temperate man. Jesus was perfect. He was sinless. So I, I love being able to look at different examples of, of things that happen in his life to show us how we ought to deal with things, how we ought to deal in different situations and be in control and be temperate. Look at verse number 19 of John chapter number 18. Because this is going to be something, and this goes now more to controlling your actions and your emotions and reactions to something that might happen to you, being in control and not flying off the handle and letting emotion take over in response to, to something that happens to you that's not right. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says, The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. So he's, he's, he's like standing before the high priest and being demanded to answer for himself, right? And Jesus answers in verse 20. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and the te in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me. What have I said unto them? Behold, they know what I said. So basically he's saying... I don't have to tell you what I said. Go ask everyone else because everything I taught was public. I'm not going around in secret. I haven't done anything and said anything to anyone else that I haven't said in the, in the synagogues. You want to know what I said? Just ask anybody. Let them bear witness of me. One, he's not incriminating himself, right? He's, he's using that God-given right to be able to just say, you know, I'm not going to tell you give you some opportunity to use something against me, but just go ahead and ask everyone else because I'm, I'm public. I'm open with what I teach and what I believe. 
Go ask anyone else. Nothing wrong with Jesus saying any of that. And he's boldly saying that, by the way. He's not, you know, not intimidated. Look at verse number 22, though. It says, And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? He basically slaps him. He smacks Jesus Christ. Now, just for a second, consider that Jesus isn't just an ordinary man. I mean, just think about putting yourself in those shoes and you just say, you know what? I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't taught in secret. Just ask anybody what I said. And then someone goes, what? Oh, about you, my blood would start to boil. That would make me mad. And I'm not the son of God. I'm not the prince of peace and the king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus was. You imagine the disrespect and, and what, a, you know, what a big deal this is for that to happen to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, just to be smacked in the head and for doing nothing wrong and saying nothing wrong. And being totally righteous and just to get smacked like that. But what did he do? Jesus had the power to do whatever he wanted. He could have called legions of angels and just been like, no, you don't, you don't slap me around. He could have. He had the ability to do so. He had the power to do so. Obviously, it's not why he was here. It wasn't his purpose. And he was also giving us an example. He controlled himself. And here's what he did. Verse 23, it says, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but if well, why smitest thou me? He didn't hit him back. He didn't cause anything else to happen. He used his words. He rebuked him. He said, hey, you know, if, I, if I've said something evil, you bear witness of it. Say what I did was evil, but otherwise, then why are you hitting me? Temperance, maintaining control in a high stress situation or in a very emotional situation where something could just put you over the edge and get you angry. You need to stay in control. Let's apply this to today. I think that this just popped into my head. I, wasn't, I didn't even think about this when I was preparing for the sermon. But this happens more and more and more in the society that we live in today. How about driving? You know, road rage. People get really, really angry out there on the road. Why? Because someone disrespects you, because someone cut you off, because someone did whatever, right, that, that you don't like. Someone's going slower in front of you. Someone's whatever, right? There's all these different reasons why people get so angry and so upset. I know what it's like to get upset, okay? Over people driving. This is the, the craziest place I think I've ever been driving in my life. People do all kinds of stupid things out there on the road. <laughs> I don't understand at all. But you have to be able to deal with that. Okay, I'm not saying, you know, you're, you're, it's a sin if you get upset over it. But you have to control yourself. Because what good is it going to do for you then to get all angry and start driving like an a, a animal yourself and start going and cutting other people off and start taking extra risk to yourself and to everyone else around you just because you're upset because someone else did something to you. That doesn't make any sense. And just because someone does something, is that worth you know, getting in a fight over? Or, you know, like, it's ridiculous. It's crazy. We need to keep control and keep level-headed in every situation of our life because we are running a race. People make some really bad decisions. You hear about it. People make decisions in situations like that, whether it be road rage or something similar, right? Someone steps on your toe. Someone bumps into you. People make life-changing decisions in an instant because they don't have control over themselves and over their emotions. People pick a fight with the wrong person, and because they feel disrespected and someone ends up dead. 
And then you got two lives ruined forever over something stupid, over people who cannot control themselves and maintain temperance. Let's look at our next example of Jesus. Look at John chapter number 2. John chapter number 2. Even when wrongfully beaten, Jesus didn't lose his temper. He maintained control. This doesn't mean that you don't that you have to just like curl up and not say anything or not defend yourself in a way, you know, like like he he still said, "Hey, that's wrong. You know, you shouldn't be doing that." He didn't just say, "I'm sorry." You know, he still stood up for himself, but he wasn't getting involved in the physical altercation, right? And, and he did maintain his cool. He didn't just lose it and start, and start brawling with this guy. John chapter 2, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. So when he comes in the temple, he sees something that makes him angry. And rightfully so, because they were making the house of God a house of merchandise, like a marketplace. They're buying and selling and conducting all this business in a house that's supposed to be a house of prayer and doing this in the wrong place. Jesus had a right to be upset and to be angry and he determined what's the proper response. Now we see in this passage, you say like, but it kind of looks like he's flipping out here. I mean, he's flipping tables over. It looks like he lost control. You know how we know he didn't lose control? It's because first we read that he sees what's happening. But then it says in verse 15, and when he had made a scourge of small cords. So he didn't see and then react immediately by throwing over tables as if it's just this, this impulsive reaction to what's going on. He saw what happened, determined what the right response is, and then he went and made a whip. Now, I don't know how long it takes to make a whip. I've seen someone do it before in my family. I forget, my uncle or my aunt, someone made a whip out of I don't know, reeds or whatever. We were, we were at a lake and they're able to braid and make this whip. But it was, it's not something you just do in like a minute. It's not something you just do really, really fast. Now, I'm sure it didn't take hours, but you know, he was able to take the time, set aside, make a scourge, and then use it to, to say, you know what? This is a big situation. I need to take care of this. And the best way to get everyone's attention is to make the whip and just drive them out of the temple. And in control, he did make a scene. He did flip over tables. But nothing that he did was intemperate. He didn't lose his temper and lose his cool. He was angry, but he, he dealt with it appropriately. He determined the right course of action and did it. And we need to maintain that type of level of control. Now, this comes to apply very important, especially for parents. Jesus walked in on a situation that made him angry, right? In his father's house. How many times, parents, do you walk in in your house to a situation with your children that makes you angry? <laughs> I know it's happened more than once with me. And you see the paint and the food and stuff all over the place on the walls and, and just this huge mess, right? It can make you kind of angry. Now, a situation like that usually calls for disciplining. It does. It's appropriate. But make sure when you go to discipline that you maintain your temper 
and your control. Because if you're losing it and you lose your cool, you could end up injuring your child, which you don't want. That's not what you want to do. That's not the goal. You want to inflict the pain of discipline and a punishment that's appropriate for what's going on, but you cannot lose control and just lose it and start beating your kid senseless because you're angry at what they did. That is not right. You need to be in charge to give the appropriate discipline, not something that's just emotional, an emotional response. And, and, I, and I recommend, if you have a problem with that, before going straight to dis discipline, you know, give yourself just a few minutes to cool off to make sure what you're doing is right and that the discipline you're giving is appropriate. It's important because, again, you, may, you can make a bad emotional decision really quickly and end up doing something you don't, intend, you don't really want to do. Because you're not acting in control. You're not being temperate. Turn, if you would, to James chapter number three. Another very important area of our life that we need to maintain control and be temperate in is over the things that we say, our mouth. Very important. James chapter 3, we're going to start reading at the beginning of the chapter here. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. So he gives two examples here of leading about a horse or a ship. And in both cases, you can control the whole body or the whole thing with one small piece. So putting a bit, right? It's a, a bit in a horse's mouth. You turn that one way or the other, you're going to control the direction and what, you know, where you want that horse to go and it, it's just this one small piece that gives you control over a large animal. Same thing with a boat. It's got that rudder, right? You have a huge boat, but that one little piece is going to control the direction that that ship's going. We're talking about being in control and being temperate today. And this is now being applied to your tongue, which is a very small part of your body, but can have very large implications and control really can control the direction that you are going. So we need to maintain control over this. Look what it says in verse number five. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. You look at that huge... Um, huge fires, you know, these disasters... How often they start with this little brush fires that just burn and get way out of control. We used to have a problem with that in Arizona. And California has a lot of them too. And they start from like a cigarette being thrown out the, the window of a car. And all of a sudden it turns into this massive forest fire where, you know, where you got this huge destruction and people's homes being destroyed. All starting with just a little, a little bit. And the Bible's relating a fire like that to your tongue. You can say things, and it doesn't even have to be a lot. You could say just a little bit and start lots of problems, lots of drama, lots of damage and hurt to people just by the words that you say. I mean, marriages have ended over words that people have said to each other that are just very hurtful things to say things that you shouldn't say to, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of situations where people have been very, very hurt. We need to be taking our tongue and control of our tongue very, very important. And this is, this is great marriage advice. 
right here. You want to take control. You want to have a happy marriage. Get control of your tongue. Men and women. Both. When you live with someone, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be fights. You care about each other, especially you love each other. You know, someone's doing something you don't like or going in a direction you're like, whatever, whatever. There's so many different reasons that you might end up finding yourself in an argument or a fight. Learn how to control your tongue. It will save you a lot of heartache. It could save your marriage. Don't say things that you know you don't mean. Especially. Learn how to control it because you can cause the smallest of matters to blow up out of proportion and have these huge destroying fires in your life because you weren't careful with what you're letting out of your mouth. And everybody should know that what I'm saying is true. I mean, it's not only it's biblical truth, but if you, you've experienced things like that, you know that's true. And it deserves a lot of focus to be able to control what you say and, and practice in these highly emotional situations to step back and take control of yourself and control your tongue and don't allow yourself to say things that you, don't, you know you ought not to say. Gain that control. Turn if you would to 2 Peter chapter number 1. I'm not completely getting off this subject of, of controlling your tongue, but it's tied in with patience that we're going to see this from 2 Peter chapter number 1. There's so a little bit more I want to add to this subject. Verse number 3 of 2 Peter chapter 1, the Bible reads, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Virtue is doing right. You, have, you start off with faith, you add to your faith virtue, and the virtue knowledge. You start to understand more about why you're doing right and what your faith is. In verse number six, it says, into knowledge temperance. So now you have the knowledge, you need to be able to control in order to con con comply with that knowledge from the Bible. Maintain and control. And then it says, into temperance, patience. In order to be in control, you need to have patience. You need to be able to see it through and not get out of control. Maintain that patience. It says, into patience, godliness, and the godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So very important attributes to have. All of them, very important, but we're just covering temperance and, and now patience a little bit. Get this down in your life. Get that control, and this will cause you to not be barren or unfruitful. Flip over to 1 Peter chapter number 2. It's the last, last page I'm going to last passage we're going to look at. 1 Peter chapter number 2. We're going to again see the perfect example of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if, when you be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. What he's saying is, what, you know, if you do wrong, and you get buffeted or you know, hit or beaten for it, and you, and you take it patiently, well, yeah, you should take it patiently. You, you should accept the punishment that you already deserve. But he's saying, of course you should. Right? I mean, you brought it on yourself. Of course you shouldn't get mad about getting in trouble and receiving for, for your own actions what you already deserve. 
But what he's saying here, he's saying like, yeah, of course, but when you suffer wrongfully, when it's not your fault, when you're being put in a situation, when you're getting beat, when you're, doing, when you're getting, receiving punishment for things that you didn't do, and you're able to take that patiently, that is honorable. That is something that God looks to as, as a positive attribute to have, to be able to say, okay, that's a godly attribute to have, to be able to take things patiently, even when someone does you wrong, you don't deserve it at all. Why? As we continue reading, that's the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Verse number 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Very clear. This isn't just, oh, well, Jesus came to do that to pay for our sins. Of course, we know that, but that was just him. You know, I don't have to take things you know, suffer things wrongfully. Jesus did that for me, but I don't have to do it. Well, no, he actually did this to leave us an example that we should follow in his steps. It's actually one of the things that he was doing that saying, no, you, now you do the same thing. You behave the same way. I gave you the example. Verse number 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. So when people were reviling Jesus Christ and just speaking manner of evil against him and blaspheming him, he didn't just have a comeback. Oh, yeah, well, your mom is so, you know, he didn't, he didn't come back when he was being reviled. I know they probably weren't doing your mama jokes back then, but you never know. There's nothing new under the sun. Maybe they were, but <laughs> however they were reviling him, right? They were saying, they were saying way worse things. Hurtful things. People could use hurtful language and revile you. But the example he left was not to just go and attack back. Don't just start hurting them. And again, tying it in with the marriage thing, that's probably the number one thing that you want to do. Your wife or your husband says something mean and nasty to you. What do you want to do? Say something mean and nasty right back to them. Right? That's what your flesh wants to do. Your flesh wants to, to bring, well, you're going to bring me down a notch. I'm going to bring you down a notch. How do you like it, right? You want to inflict the same pain that you're receiving. That is not a godly attitude. That, well, I'll tell you this, that will never, ever work to solve the problems that you have, ever. That, that is not a solution. It's just going to make things worse. That's going to add fuel to the fire, at least one person needs to be able to be a little bit more Christ-like and just receive it. And especially if it's wrongfully. Receive it. Allow for it to happen. Yes, it hurts. It's not pleasant. But that's not an excuse to go back and just continue the cycle of, of wrong upon wrong upon wrong. And in the end, it'll work. You overcome evil with good. It'll work. It may not work overnight. Let's say you have an example of, of a wife whose husband is just mean, nasty, rotten to her. Maybe the wife's real godly and trying to do what's right and try to go to church, but her husband is just, you know, always berating her, always talking down, always just, just being a jerk, right? Well, in today's society, what's the, the, the common thing? And not just today's society, but just if you're in the flesh, what are you going to want to do as the wife? You're going to want to hurt him back. Because you don't like hearing that. That's not going to help your situation at all. It'll continue. But if you're able to receive it and suffer it and allow it, there's going to be a point where that guy is going to say, how can I keep on treating her this way when she's not doing anything to me? He said, it might not happen the first time or the second time, but if this is a reoccurring event that's happening, there's going to be a point to where they're going to, they're going to notice and see that and recognize what a jerk they've been. That'll solve the problem. It should solve the problem. It 
says in verse uh, 23 here, it says, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Committed himself to God. You just pray to God. This is, this is what we see throughout the Psalms. We see when David's on the run. When David's being persecuted wrongfully. When all these bad things are happening to him. He's like, look, I'm just trying to serve you. Did he go and, and right every wrong? No. We see him calling on God. God, you're my defense. God, you see what's happening to me. God, help me. It takes a level of control to do that. To be able to step aside and say, well, this, there's some wrong things that are happening here, but it's not my responsibility to right every wrong. And I'm just going to do what's right. And I'm going to suffer it. Jesus Christ suffered way more for me than I could ever suffer in this life. So I'll just suffer it and, and go to God and rely on the Lord to help the situation. It says in verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Temperance, be in control. It's not easy, but high emotions, you know, someone doing you wrong, being persecuted, Stay in control. Make the right choice. Suffer yourself to be defrauded. Suffer yourself to go through some, some pain. Right? Don't just turn around and try to inflict more pain when it happens to you. That's the right way to approach these problems. God will set everything right. And if you can, can accept and take what's being done, I mean, that's what, that's what Jesus Christ did. So you'd be in good company. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that you give us, Lord, and that we know that your words are true and that we could have faith in, in things that may seem not as intuitive to us because in the flesh we want to just to, to go right back and, and hurt someone back, dear Lord, but... There is so much wisdom in your words and in your teaching, dear God, and I pray that you would please help us, help us to have the strength to maintain control, to be temperate in all things, that we could run this race and run it well and, and strive for that prize. Help us to keep our body in subjection to us, whatever our areas are, especially the areas of weakness that we might have in our flesh, help us to overcome that and to gain control. Lord, give us the power to do so. God, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.